So let's listen to these youngsters from South Africa, these guys that, you know, that, that are being worked with at the moment with the gospel that they offered to read the Bible to us this morning. So enjoy the reading. Acts 8 to verse 1 to 8. And Saul approved of his execution, and there was a and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, devout men, buried Stephen, and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house of the house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what is being said by Philip when they heard him and, the, and saw the signs he, that he did. For unclean spirits came out of men who were possessed crying with a loud voice, and men who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Acts 11, 19 to 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over, Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to now except Jews. But there were some of them men of Cyprus and Ceylon. Who on, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to, turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears in the church of Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the Christ of God, he was exhorted, exhorted them all to the right to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Taurus to look for Saul, and when they had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For all year they, went, they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Loving Father, we praise your mighty name that we can hold in our hands your very word. And now we ask as we open it and study it together that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit upon each of us that we might hear your voice and that you strengthen us to obey you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you take your seats and uh, open your Bibles, please, to uh, Acts chapter 8 that was beautifully read for us in those lovely South African accents. I did love hearing that read. But I was grateful at times for subtitles as well. I want us to think this morning about one word that appeared three times across those two readings. And the word is the word scattered. Scattered. In Acts 8, and verse 1, we read, There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Israel, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. In Acts 8 and verse 4, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And in Acts 11 and verse 19, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Just put yourself for a moment in the shoes of the disciples in Jerusalem at this time. For the young Jerusalem church in Acts 8, I just wonder if that persecution that arose, resulting in a scattering, really seemed to them a blessing from the Lord (laughs) or devastation from the Lord, an opposition that was arising, a huge setback to their ministry. I mean, they've seen some amazing things take place in Jerusalem. 
We've seen Peter and John going about preaching and healing and even raising dead people. And we've seen Stephen preaching. We've seen numbers being added daily to those who are being saved. God was on the move. Things were growing and it was exciting in Jerusalem. And then the opposition of the Jewish authorities that we saw in the previous chapter when Stephen is executed now is extended to the whole church in Jerusalem. The enemy has risen up, it seems, and caused them to scatter. Oh, that's a terrible thing, surely, you might think, they might think. Now, if we pay attention to the whole book, the whole narrative of the book of Acts, we might see, actually, that the scattering of the believers to Judea and Samaria that we read about in verse 1, in some senses actually echoes the command of Jesus in Acts 1.8 when he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And they were doing that quite effectively. In Judea and Samaria, yeah, maybe not so much at that time. And to the ends of the earth, <laughs> no idea what that means. You can imagine the disciples wrestling with that call of Christ. And it could seem like, it looks like to me, the Lord here is using the persecution that rises up to cause the believers in Jerusalem to do that very thing he'd commanded them to do, which was to go to the ends of the earth. Now, before we get into the meat of Acts chapter 8, I want us first to see that this idea of scattering, the scattering of God's people, is not a new New Testament idea. In fact, you could argue that the biblical mandate to scatter goes right back to the first page of the Bible, to the book of Genesis. When God tells Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 28, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. God scattering his image bearers throughout his creation. And then after the flood, God gives the same command to Noah in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Scatter across the whole of creation. Steward it. Subdue it. Be my image bearer. And the next chapter, after chapter 9, chapter 10, tells us how Noah's descendants spread out throughout the earth. So you have details of Japheth and Ham and Shem's descendants. And the word says, they spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their ethnic groups. That's what it says in chapter 9. They spread in their lands, each with their own language, by their clans, in their ethnic groups. And Genesis 10, 32 sums this up by saying, these are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Scattering the people, scattering the image bearers throughout the earth. And then chapter 11 happens of Genesis. Babel, the land of Shinar. And something's gone seriously wrong. Because now we read in Genesis 11, the earth's got one language. But they were scattered in multiple languages. The earth's got one language. Here in Shinar, the people have gathered together and settled and stayed in this one place and sought to make a name for themselves in rebellion to the command of God. So what does God do? Genesis eleven seven. Come, let us go down, God says, and there confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8. So the Lord dispersed, scattered, dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth. Just as his original plan had been. God mandates that image bearers should be scattered 
in all the earth, declaring the plans and intentions of the Lord so that the words of things like Habakkuk 2.14 come true, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Not Shinar filled with that knowledge, not Jerusalem filled with that knowledge, but the world, the earth, the whole earth will be filled. So it's not a new idea. (laughs) And after his resurrection, Jesus, once again, God in Christ, commands his followers to scatter. He says to them, wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God's image bearers becoming God's gospel bearers, ambassadors of the word, as the prayer we had earlier said. It's the same theme, scattering the people in all the earth to bear witness to what God has done in Christ for all nations. Acts 8.1, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered. Does that not sound like God stirring them up to do the very thing he commanded them to do? Were they being disobedient? Was God nudging them on? Not entirely sure, but what I do see in the text is that Stephen's martyrdom in chapter 7 leads to a great persecution And the great persecution leads to a great dispersion or scattering. And the great dispersion leads to widespread evangelism in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And if you look at verse 4, we start in Samaria, don't we? Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. That first verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. The NIV has it as preach the word wherever they went. Scattered Christians should scatter seed wherever they go. Scattered Christians scatter the word of the gospel wherever they go. These scattered Christians didn't hide away in terror didn't sit there lamenting that they'd been thrust out from Jerusalem. They didn't keep silent for fear of facing what Stephen faced. No. They preached the word wherever they went. They proclaimed the Christ like Philip did. Now you might be of the opinion that being a minister of the gospel, being a preacher of the word, is the job of the preachers. <laughs> it's great. Scott gets to do that, and Rich gets to do that, and a few others get to do that. Yeah, the preachers of the word, yeah, we get that. They're the people. They're the ones who've got this responsibility. Likewise, the work of mission, that's for those people that we call missionaries. Oh, I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> this is not a work for the... This is, this is a work for the vocal. It's a work for the educated. It's a work for the trained, the gifted. Only if I've got a gift of evangelism should I go and do this. No, no. I want you to see in Acts 8, emphatically, the people who took up this task were not the apostles. Did you see that? Did you see what it says in Acts 8? All were scattered except the apostles. All were scattered except the apostles. And when the believers go out, they all go out preaching the word wherever they went. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem at this point. It was the generality of believers in the church that took up this task. And the text focuses on Philip. Not the apostle Philip. It's not the apostle Philip. This is one of the seven, one of the deacons, those guys who are, who are called to, 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 to serve on tables to set the apostles aside for the ministry of the word and prayer. We read about them in Acts 6. This is Philip. A table waiter, (laughs) like Stephen before him. He is out doing this ministry. He wasn't an apostle. All except the apostles. I think it's a really important phrase. I used to struggle a lot 
that Acts 1.8, Jesus said to those people there and then, those apostles, not for me. Acts 1.8 is for them, not for me. Acts 1.8, flip it. Acts 8.1 tells you, no, no, that's not the case. <laughs> Acts 1.8 might make you think it's apostles only. Acts 8.1 makes you see all the believers except the apostles. Wow, that changes it, doesn't it? The whole church is scattered, and those who are scattered preach the word and proclaim the Christ. Does it worry you about being called as a believer to preach the word? I'm not a preacher. I couldn't do that. The word that's translated here, preached, is the, is the verb form of the word gospel. If you were going to use it, you could say they gospeled. They went about gospeling. And there are many ways in which we are called to do that, brothers and sisters, Preaching is a really important one, and I'm not in any sense diminishing it. But if you're not called or gifted to preach, you are called. And he gifts you to gospel, wherever he's placed you, wherever he's sending you. They shared the good news about Jesus. Let's say that. They shared the good news about Jesus. Some preached, they proclaimed the Christ, but it wasn't just the scripture teachers who were doing that. It's an all-inclusive commission for all followers of Jesus. And where, where did they do this work? Wherever they went. Wherever they went. That's the church's mission field. Wherever all of us go, we are all to scatter the good seed of the gospel, to share the good news. And they start in Samaria. I love that. Samaria, what a place to start for a Jewish guy. Philip went down to the city of Samaria, verse 5, and proclaimed to them the Christ. We should not overlook the fact that Samaritans and Jews have been fierce enemies for centuries. <laughs> and the first place, the first place that one is scattered to is to the enemy, <laughs> the so-called enemy. Jews and Samaritans despised each other. They made every effort to avoid each other. It was normal to try and avoid going through Samaria if you were Jewish. And when Jesus does that in John 4, which I think you've just finished studying as a church, when Jesus does that in John 4, I think the disciples are horrified. And then he goes and stands by a well talking to a Samaritan woman and they're a little bit appalled by what's going on here because these are, these are Samaritans. They're Samaritans. This city in Samaria... I think refers to the capital. It's near modern-day Nablus in the West Bank, quite close to Jacob's well. Now, I don't know if there's any link here between the ministry of Jesus of those two days recorded in John 4, 41, and the great impact that he had through the testimony of the Samaritan woman. I don't know if there's a link there between that event and the fact that Philip first goes to a place that the Lord has previously visited. Part of me wants to think, the Lord's gone before him. The Lord goes before us. When we think we're going to a new place, Jesus doesn't follow us. <laughs> yes, he's with us, but he's been there before. He's already at work in the world, in the field. But he calls us to go to those places he's prepared. To go to those places he's prepared. And it, Philip has an amazing impact. There's such an incredible impact that we read about so many people crying out to the Lord. In fact, he's so successful, the church in Jerusalem gets a bit worried about it, and they send Peter and John later in the chapter to visit, to verify that actually Samaritans have even become believers. It's so unbelievable. Samaritans too, wow. And if we had the time to go through the next chapters, we'd see how the spread of the gospel through those being scattered continues to the Ethiopian official in, in chapter 8, to Saul's conversion and commission to the Gentiles in chapter 9, to Cornelius and his Gentile family in chapter 10. And when they receive the Spirit, the Jerusalem church again comes down. Has, oh, a report has to be sent to the Jerusalem church. What on earth's going on? Gentiles are believing too. Something remarkable is going on. And when we reach Acts eleven nineteen, we read these words. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews, but there were some of them. 
men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who spoke to the Hellenists, the Greek speakers also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21 says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. This huge shift in salvation history from Jews through Judea to Samaria. And now we're beginning to see the ends of the earth being engaged. And then the delegation comes down again from the church in Jerusalem. What's going on now? There's all these people coming to faith. So they send Barnabas. And Barnabas goes and collects Saul, Paul from Antioch. And then we know the rest of Acts. This, this scattering, I want you to see, this scattering of God's ordinary people was and is his means by which that original mandate to fill the earth with image bearers is now transformed to fill the earth with gospel bearers, with ambassadors of the word. This is restated by Jesus at the resurrection. This is restated prior to his ascension. This is what that great commission that we're going to think about later on today is all about. To the present day, we are called to scatter to the nations. Can it be that the church in the modern world has forgotten this original mandate? That we're to be scattered to the ends of the earth, scattering gospel seed, and it's ordinary Christians who God is calling to do that. Because in so many parts of the world, you will know there aren't any gospel seed being scattered. No, 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 that can't be the case in the 21st century, Jared. We learned yesterday, one third of the global population, 3.2 billion people, do not have access to the gospel. We'll never meet a Christian. There is no church in their ethnic group. That's today, 21st century. Now, I work for OMF, a missionary society, and I am fully committed to the need for certain people to experience this kind of calling and come to the church and be commissioned to be sent out as long-term missionaries. People who may have moved in the past to countries like Vietnam or a brother from North Ferriby down the road who three months ago moved to Japan to study Japanese and to study Japanese culture, to work with a Japanese church plant in a place where there's hardly any believers at all. Or another couple currently working with us from Wakefield who are looking at moving to Sumatra in Indonesia to teach in a Bible college to help the Christians in Indonesia reach out to the 87% of Muslim, 87% of Indonesians who are Muslim who don't know Jesus. There's a still a huge need for these people to be called from the global church to be set apart, to be theologically and missiologically trained, learn language and culture and commit to long-term service. But I've learned over these last years in my role that the vast majority of Christians look at people like that and say, oh, God bless you. Thank goodness he's not done that to me. <laughs> oh, I couldn't imagine anything worse. Or they might think, oh, I could never do that. I couldn't, I couldn't be that missionary. No, no, that's for super spiritual people. <laughs> Get to know some missionaries, you realize they're normal people. Or you might think, oh, my church would ever support me. I couldn't do that. And so the majority of the church concludes they've got no part to play in God's command to scatter. But what if the word, the Lord through his word is teaching us that God still wants all his children to be scattering, dispersing, going to those places particularly where there are no gospel bearers. And what if we come to see that God has already given us perfect vehicles with which to do that? And it doesn't actually depend only on those people who are going to give up their jobs and go and be trained and move to the side of the world and learn language for years and years and years. But actually, 
we can also use our careers, our interests, our passions to intentionally go to a place where there are very few Christians and serve him in our jobs. I teach at universities quite a lot. Students all say, oh, I could never be a missionary. <laughs> and then I say, but would you ever think about working overseas as an IT professional or as an occupational therapist or as a teacher or uh, as a graphic designer? There you go, Rose, did it again. <laughs> and they say, oh, yeah, I could do that. Do you not see those two things can accomplish the same task? Working together to go and take your job with you and work alongside a local church if there's one or work alongside long-term workers if there are some is such an important part of what God is doing in his mission, in his world. For the earth to be filled with the, glory, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to take all the resources of the global church. Not just a few, but all of us. Being willing to say to the Lord, oh, wow, okay, here I am. Here's my job, here's my career, here's my plans, Lord. <laughs> and rather than saying, Lord, bless my plans, say, Lord, you overhaul my plans with your plan. I'm yours. You're Lord, not me. So take my life, take my career, take my dreams, take how you've made me and equipped me to be and send me where you want. That's a dangerous prayer. But God may say, you are where I want you to be. Hallelujah. So serve me where you are. But God will also say to, to quite a few people, I think, I want you to move there. Maybe somewhere else in the UK. Maybe somewhere in Europe. Maybe some end of the earth. We can't simply seek to send fully supported, so-called full-time Christian workers. We should be facilitating, praying for, and scattering all God's people. God's at work doing that. And every one of us in this room today who follows Jesus is a full-time Christian worker. You know that, don't you? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you did this to me yesterday. Yes, it's true. Every one of us in this room who loves Jesus is a full-time Christian worker. And in some ways, we're seeing this already in our land, aren't we? And I love our church in Huddersfield uh, is a very multicultural church. And I love being here and singing songs with you guys in other languages. It's just a joy because God is at work bringing a new mission force to our lands. Yeah? God is scattering brothers and sisters by all sorts of strange means from all these other countries represented here, whether it be people fleeing persecution or people on economic migration, international students, professionals, asylum seekers and migrants are causing our churches to grow. That's where the church growth is in the UK. Migrant churches who are often coming with a passion and a desire to reach British people to partner alongside the British church to re-evangelize the old colonial empire. We've got Nigerian brothers coming back with the attitude of, now the empire is going to strike back. We're here to re-evangelize those who sent the gospel to us years ago. How exciting is that? And it's so important for us to recognize we are no longer primarily senders, but we are also receivers. And we need to receive well and partner with our brothers and sisters here in this church who God is calling to reach out to British people. We've got to help them understand how British people think. How do we communicate the gospel to secular British society today? Our brothers and sisters who are here with that passion need our help to do that because we're here to work together. But the reverse is also true. We still have a role as the British church However battered and bruised and defensive we feel, God is still calling some of us to go and scatter into the nations and your brothers and sisters globally want you to be there. You're not imposing something upon another. We're invited. We served in a big country that I can't name because you're live streamed for a long time and the brothers and sisters in that country said, we need people like you to come and work alongside us. Not to lead it, not to be in charge and tell us what to do. We've got so much to learn from the global church, but we've still got a part to play. God is still calling people out 
to disperse across the world, to move to those places, especially where there are too few gospel-bearing witnesses. Maybe you are beginning to recognize this call to be faithful to God's mandate from the beginning, to fill the earth. And maybe you are thinking, wow, I never, I never thought that, that my job, my, my career, my interests and passions could be used by God. I thought I had to kind of, kind of, kind of suffer and, and go unwillingly and give it all up and oh, it sounded really hard. But what, you want me to use my joys? <laughs> He's your heavenly father. He's given you these gifts and skills so you can glorify him in them. He doesn't necessarily call you to give them all up. There's always a cost to every one of us to be faithful. But to consider how God might cause you to be scattered. And if that's you, I'd love you to take the chance today to talk to me or to Sarah, some of the elders and the international team, and say, I'd just love to have a conversation about what that might look like. I'd love just to talk with you, to pray with you, and encourage you to start thinking in this way. Because God is working his redemptive plan out for his world. God's got a mission, and his mission has a church. You know it's that way around, right? Some of you think the church has got a mission on the side. No, no, no. God's got a mission. The reconciliation of all things to himself. And he's got a church to fulfill that mission. Let us each, as members of God's great global church, be willing to offer ourselves fully to him afresh this morning to go wherever, whenever, and do whatever he commands us to do. Let me pray. Father, we, we love you. And we've committed ourselves to you. Lord Jesus, we call you Lord because that is who you are. I pray for each one of us in this room this morning and those listening online that you would help us to surrender control of our lives to our true Lord and be prepared to say to him, okay, here I am. Scatter me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.